Hey everyone, Gil Gross here. I interviewed Paul Anacone for my other show, Three, with Joel Drucker, Amy Lundy, and myself, where we cover Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic, and Roger Federer. Um, and we've been covering the coaching trees of the big three. So we did a show on Tony Nadal and Carlos Moya, Rafael Nadal's coaching. We also did a show on Novak Djokovic's coaching, where we talked about Yelena Gencic and Marion Vida, of course, along with Boris Becker and even Pepe Imaz and, of course, currently Goran Ivanisevic. And then most recently, we covered Roger Federer. These are some of my three favorite shows that we've done. We are 65 episodes into this show. Of course, Paul Anacone, former coach of Tim Henman, former coach of Pete Sampras, former coach of Roger Federer, which is why we had him on here, and current coach, among others, of Taylor Fritz. So here it is, the Paul Anacone talk. We're joined on three by Roger Federer's coach from 2010 to 2013, Paul Anacone on the show. Paul, thanks so much for, for being on. Um, you are our first guest on three. This is not a show with guests. Oh, wow. Really? Okay. That's yeah. good. Good to know. I feel very privileged, really privileged. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Speaking of feeling privileged, I want to know first, uh, first off, how you learned that you were going to coach Roger Federer. You have a unique insight and I think people are interested. How does this all work when, when a player is out there selecting a coach? And I know there are different methods, but when did you learn you were Federer's coach and what was that process like? Um, I, I'm trying to remember. I think his agent, who's a friend of mine, um, got in touch with me in the summer 2010 and asked me if I would have any interest in doing a trial period with Roger and then, you know, going from there to see if we both thought it was a good match. And I had known Roger for a long time from when I coached Tim Henman and also when I coached Pete Sampras when Roger was real young. So we knew each other and I knew Roger had... Um, he was uh, coachless at the time, and um, you know I'd seen him a bunch of different times, but I didn't know that until Tony Godzik, his agent, reached out, and then uh, we chatted a couple times on the phone, and then uh, had a couple weeks in Zurich, and then from there we uh, we kind of got it rolling. So I was pretty lucky. I was a, a very uh, amazing few years of my life, um, and uh, luckily for me. I got to ride uh, in the passenger seat of some pretty special people, and Roger's one of them. So it, it's been fun. I, I was really fortunate. We had a great run, and uh, he's still a very dear friend. So it's, it's been good. It's great to hear. And you mentioned that Roger was coachless when, at the time uh, when you came on. And I think Federer is unique from Nadal and Djokovic. And we, we covered Tony Nadal. We covered Marion Vida, who has been a part of Djokovic's team for literally 18 years. Roger likes to mix it up. And, and sometimes he didn't mind not even having a coach. Why do you think his formula for success was different than the others in terms of having different people come in and sometimes having nobody in that specific head coaching role? Well, I think one of the most important things in an individual sport is knowing yourself and knowing your personality and your life and, and knowing um, the strengths and weaknesses of that. And I think Roger knows himself really well. Um, he's historically a student of the game, understands the game really well. Um, and he had a bunch of terrific coaches growing up. So the foundation was there. His wife, Mirka, you know, is a former pro player. So she understands the game really well. And more importantly, understands Roger really well. So I, I think Roger's really interesting in so far as he, he really enjoys different perspectives. He's an expansive thinker. And I think that's why he's had a bunch of different coaches. Um, and I think also his personality is so affable. That's why, you know, I don't know anybody that worked with him that is not his friend still. So, I mean, we, you know, ours was a great tenure. I really enjoyed it. But I think a, it's mostly personality driven. And um, I don't think there's any ill intent. I think he's a really interested person to hear different, different perspectives. More coaches, more friends. Uh, here's a question from uh, my co-host, Joel Drucker. Uh, he's interested in a little bit of compare comp contrast with Federer and, and Sampras, uh, who, as you mentioned, you also coached for um, a while. Practice sessions, uh, training sessions, the approach to, to going out there and training. Were there any main big differences between how they like to train? I think, well, personality-wise, they're very different. 
um, but they got to their same place in their goal orientation with very different methods. And what I mean by that is they, they both understood each other, I'm sorry, both understood themselves really well. As I said about Roger, Pete knew exactly what he needed to do to be successful much more insular and insulated. And Roger is a, an extrovert and he's out there in the world. Um, in terms of preparation, they're pretty similar. They worked hardest in the preseason. And luckily for them, because they win so much during the year, they're playing so many matches that a lot of their fitness um, and their training gets done because they win so much. And, and you know, when there is the few um, breaks in the calendar, they're both pretty diligent about getting ready for the clay court season, making sure they're prepared for the differences then for the grass court season. And I think the key is that, like I said, they, they know themselves really well. Um, Roger, I, I think was, um, I think Roger enjoyed probably uh, the process a little more than Pete did. Roger's kind of a goofy kid at heart. He loved, you know, he's always practical jokes and, but he works really hard got a good team around him and again Pete was more insular so he would be with his strength and conditioning guy whoever it was at the time and then I would do the tennis stuff and then he'd have his physio and then he'd have his life so Pete was more mono focused and Roger was more expansive but I think that they worked very smart for themselves it works for how they played what about the approach to pre-match game planning it seems that every player wants to know different things and go into different levels of depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and uh, well, those guys are different. Pete was again, um, less information, a small, more compact period of time. Didn't like to spend hours talking about stuff. Originally when Roger and I were together, we did a lot of video stuff. We watched a lot of uh, different matches that he had played successes and failures in hotel rooms. Um, and then talked about that and discussed things. So he was more uh, into the process of hearing ideas, seeing ideas. Pete was really locked into, okay, this is how I play. He knew how he played, knew his game really well. How do I plug that in tomorrow against X? And, and you know, literally really brief conversations, usually the night before, and then just a quick reminder the day of when he's warming up for the match or in the locker room just another couple minutes in the locker room and then just get it battened down a little bit. Now, if Pete was going through a time where maybe he wasn't serving well or was having a problem returning or whatever it may be, there might be more conversation about that, just some key triggers to make sure he had the right thoughts, but it was pretty streamlined. And like I said, Roger, it was really interesting because he did like to look at video for a while. He talked about historical things, what's been successful, where he's had challenges. So uh, very different. This is one from uh, my co-host, Amy Lundy. Federer was temperamental in his youth. That was kind of the reputation in the story that's told. You got a front row seat watching him carry himself both on and off the court and becoming known later on as literally one of the coolest customers in the history of the sport. How would you explain how Roger Federer is able to accomplish that, especially knowing that it didn't really come naturally to him? Well, I think, you know, Again, I, I think his maturation process allowed it to happen. You know, I asked him about it when we were together years ago and, and, and I asked if it was something someone said or a coach or his parents or whatever. And he said it was a little bit of, of a bunch of things, but he said, ultimately, I just realized to myself that if I'm that emotional and those things can knock me off the rails, then I can't think my way through what's going on out there. And, and you know, he used to, he put in terms, he used to say, and, and I need to be able to find solutions and I can't find solutions if I'm really emotional and things are, are going awry. So I had to figure out how to manage the emotions and get disappointed, but not let it ruin the rest of the match and be happy and not let it ruin the rest of the match. So I, I, I just basically made the decision myself after getting a bunch of uh, uh, feedback both myself and also hearing it from his parents and hearing from other coaches, but really he said it was himself that just hit the switch and said, I, I got to get better at this. Paul, we all appreciate the time. Thank you. No, I appreciate it, Gil. Thanks so much.